All right, in the first, I am not going to say anything because we need to have time for a, a really important speaker today. So we're going to start with Alexa doing today's case presentation. There are plenty of coffee mugs. We're going to hold on to them. They'll be free next week. And is it ever going to heat up? What's going on here? Am I just old or is it cold out there? Both. to make this small. All right, we're going to get started. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, I am Alexa. I'm one of the third year child neuro residents and I will be talking about our case today. So we have a 33 year old female. She is currently 18 weeks pregnant, G6, T2. She has past medical history of obstructive sleep apnea, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, migraines, and numerous spontaneous miscarriages with previous pregnancies. She presents to the ED with retroorbital pain in her right eye. Family history is notable for multiple sclerosis in her mother, and we were consulted specifically to rule out optic neuritis. So just a general timeline of her symptoms, six days prior to presentation at the ED, she developed first pain behind her right eye, and then later that same day noted that she had pain, particularly with adduction of that eye. The next day she was evaluated in an outside hospital. She was told her symptoms were due to migraine and also found to have hypertension for which she was prescribed procardia. The next day, so four days prior to presentation at Duke, she then developed intermittent blurring of vision in her right eye. And then on the day of presentation to Duke, she was first seen by an outside optometrist who saw that there was potential blurring of the optic disc in that right eye and then told her to go to the ED for a quick evaluation. So in addition to us, our ophthalmologic colleagues were also involved. Our exam had a relative afferent pupillary defect in that eye, but otherwise was normal and non-focal. The ophthalmologic exam um, had concern for reduced color vision, perhaps inferior visual field deficits and an APD in that eye. Otherwise it was normal for visual acuity 2020 bilaterally and no definitive blurring of the nerve margins. Just a really quick workup for her. She had a mild anemia, mild elevation of her inflammatory markers, normal thyroid studies. Um, at the time in which we saw her, she also had cooking an infectious and rheumatologic workup, which wasn't available to us at the time, but came back normal. So here is her MRI brain in orbits with and without contrast. Um, as you can see with the lovely arrow sign, she has swelling of the medial rectus on that right side. So while, oh, that's a spoiler. So while we were originally consulted for optic neuritis, she was diagnosed with thyroid eye disease. So thyroid eye disease is an autoimmune condition typically seen in people with Graves' disease, but it can also be seen in individuals with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And the antibodies in these diseases will attack the orbital fibroblasts and adipocytes behind the eye. This will then cause a fibroblast proliferation and adipogenesis, which causes the accumulation of glycosaminoglycans in those tissues, which can then, as we saw in our patient, cause enlargement of the extraocular muscles and connective tissue. Classically, individuals with thyroid eye disease will present with an asymmetric exophthalmos, conjunctival injection, and periorbital edema. As we saw in our patient, it can also present with retroorbital or orbital pain, blurred vision, and color vision desaturation. Additional symptoms for thyroid eye disease could include diplopia or excessive tearing, or it can be completely asymptomatic. So in workup for thyroid eye disease, it involves two main things, imaging first to rule out any space occupying lesions that could be causing their symptoms. And then lastly, you'll also wanna get thyroid function tests. However, these can be a little bit tricky because 10% of people who have thyroid eye disease won't have any evidence of hyperthyroidism, like in our patient, um, or you can also see thyroid eye disease in hypothyroidism. Notably, about 20% of people who will go on to have diagnosis of Graves or Hashimoto's will have their very first symptoms be thyroid eye disease without any um, laboratory or clinical functions, clinical findings of any other forms of hyperthyroidism. 
So the number one most important thing to do with thyroid eye disease is first to treat youth or restore youth thyroidism. As in our patient um, with mild disease, they're typically treated with steroids. If the disease is moderate or more severe with visual threatening, um, you could have orbital radiation or orbital surgical decompression as treatment. Therapies that are currently being studied to treat thyroid eye disease include Celsept, tocilizumab, and rituximab. So major takeaways from this case are that compression in thyroid eye disease can cause a dysthyroid optic neuropathy as seen in our patient, which can then cause visual symptoms like our patient had, as well as an APD. Um, so this can present pretty similarly to optic neuritis as we saw. So important to consider thyroid eye disease when clinically relevant um, in our optic neuritis consults. <laughs> that was wonderful and then it was it's a great it was a great presentation and a great assessment in the moment as well the great learning experience it shows even when you're really old uh you can still learn i'm talking about myself uh, but the difference is when you when you when you're my age and you learn something you tend to never forget it because it's really unusual that something comes up that you've never seen before. So it's very salient, as they say in the neuroscience literature. All right. So we're really honored today to have uh, Helen Mayberg do uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, I knew Helen when she was at uh, Emory. Uh, Helen's now at Mount Sinai, where she is the Mount Sinai Professor of Neurotherapeutics at the Icon School of Medicine. She got her BA at UCLA, where the weather was always nice, then was a resident at Columbia, and then a, a fellowship at Hopkins. What was the fellowship in? Interesting. See, I bet there's a good story there. Uh, so as you all know, I mean, Helen's the leader in brain stimulation techniques and neurobiology of affective disorders. And I know we've all followed her work either in the scientific literature or on TV or in the New York Times. Uh, she, in recognition of this outstanding leadership, she's a member of the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a variety of uh, other, uh, other uh, organizations of prominence. But uh, she's someone who founded a field and uh, it's a field that in her career has, has now led to private practice people hanging up shingles to stimulate people with uh, depression and uh, surgeons to go after intracranial electrodes. Because although most of us see depression in a you know, mildish form, none of us are psychiatrists, we all know that in its severe forms, it's, it's as lethal as any kind of cancer or anything of that sort. So we are thrilled to have Helen here today. And the title of the lecture is Theory to Practice, which is uh, her career, Targeted Modulation of Depression Circuits with Deep Brain Stimulation. So uh, welcome. All right, now comes the hard part, the zoom in. Share screen is down. Oh, yeah, I know. Do I do the S? Come on, uh, audience, where's the damn? This one? Why do they hide it? Why do they hide it? You know what I say, Helen, when I do this? I say, I remind myself of my mother when she first encountered an ATM machine. She would just stare at it as if it had come from outer space. I gotta do the hide first. And then you're right. Take it away. We are in business. Well, it's really nice to be here. I spent the day um, yesterday with the neurobiologist and then Monday a little bit with my um, colleague, Cameron McIntyre, who I'll give a shout out to and talks. So I have a lot of friends and collaborators here and it's really nice to be here. Just one thing is I want to use my time wisely, but you said maybe there's a story. So I was at Columbia. I had every intention of becoming a behavioral neurologist. My fellowship was lined up with Norman Geshwin, who I'd spent the most amazing month with as a medical student, as a rotator. And he said, no, you don't want to come to Boston to be a resident. You'll come and be a fellow with me. Lined up and he died. 
and he died in my last year. And I had to scramble to figure out what I was going to do. And because I didn't have a backup plan. And I had a nurse surgeon rotating with me in ICU. We're on call two o'clock in the morning doing whatever we're doing in ICU. And um, he had come from Hopkins and he had characterized the brain opiate receptors. He started telling me about the PET scanner, Hopkins, where you could map chemistry in vivo. And I'd always kind of wanted to be a psychiatrist, but I really hated that language, which will be a theme throughout. So, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a neurologist. And so again, you know, life takes you in. Yes, well, I've got a quote from him. You know, the life takes you in many directions. So for the residents, you know, it's kind of like you just follow kind of where the money is or where the science is. And, you know, I'm old. I'm older than him. So, um, you know, how do we do this? And I'll kind of share kind of what this journey is, because it's kind of follow the path, which maybe should be the, the title. So the disclosures is, you know, the DBS method was um, written up as a youth patent and it's been licensed to various companies that have bought each other and now it belongs to Abbott. And I'll talk a little bit about what that might mean. But everything I've really done has been non-commercial use of non-available devices to kind of understand what depression is. So, you know, the usual, this talk is about the neurology of depression with a question mark. Okay, the team now is broad. It's more engineers, data scientists, than it is clinicians, but you need these kinds of expertise to do what we're doing. And if the question's interesting enough, you know, people, people wanna work on it. So I wanna kind of go over kind of the thing that makes this topic appear harder than it is. Because like anything, what do we do? We, we listen to patients. And when patients describe depression, usually we go through this laundry list. But if you really listen and you look what people say at the words, it's pain and immobility. The real core, you know, what a neurologist look for, you know, sadness, psychomotor slow, there's a bunch of stuff. But that if you really just parse, and I've color coded it by, this kind of way of thinking. But when you listen to these patients, it's painful and you know it. And whenever theory of mind is, or whatever we do as doctors, when somebody has this and you feel it in your gut, just imagine what it's like for them because they can't escape the pain. That's what it is. And the rest is explanation that is not modelable. Now, what do we see? The psychiatrists have a laundry list that's all based on asking questions, which means somebody has to tell you the chief complaint, okay? And there's the list. But if you watch people and they're not talking, what do you see? Their posture's odd and their face is worse. You know when someone is suffering. You know, Duchenne was studying, you know, motor um, facial expression and took homeless people off the street and was poking on them to understand that. And look where he went with understanding muscle. Darwin watched Duchenne. And, you know, people argue now about does the face movement reflect the emotion? You know, your face can only move so many ways. And there's a neuroanatomy of how the face works. And we all know about what happens when you have a singular stroke versus you have an MCA stroke. Remember that as we kind of go through this. Again, as I try to explain to psychiatrists, they don't get it. We need to get them to learn more neurology. It's, um, it's kind of what you see. And, um, and if they learn more neurology, they probably call less consults. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about how do we quantify this? And again, is you tell psychiatrists the difference between neurology and psychiatry. Psychiatry loves the individual. We love individuals too, but we as a field do not have a problem with lumping symptoms. You don't need to give it a new name. If a Parkinson's patient has tremor dominant or no tremor, you don't kind of fuss about it, that it needs another, may have a biotype difference, may have a genetic difference, but you're comfortable with it being in that movement disorder range. 
lumping, not splitting pattern recognition, not everybody's a snowflake. And that is a branch in the road, neurology, psychiatry, to me. Um, but again, what do you see if you reduce it down? There's some interaction between pain and your inability to move away from it and kind of how you then process what that is. You don't get into depression because of thought. Thought becomes kind of the, the attempt to modify it. Now, Freud, Freud, I think, recognized a really important principle. If you don't have a tool, you, don't, you shouldn't kind of explore a problem, kind of explore what you can explore with the tools you've got. I often think about the idea of Freud had had a scanner. Where would we be? It'd be really interesting to know, but he didn't have one, so he constructed a way of thinking about it. But he went more than that. I mean, he basically called out, it's not in the brain which again, that's the hubris of knowing what you know at a point in time. And just because you're not smart enough to have the tool, or you don't even know there's a tool around that you should learn how to use, that doesn't mean it's not there. So I, I, I find this kind of an interesting quote. So where do you get at the idea of, is there a neurology of depression? So when I was resident in 1983, I read this paper by Robinson, in brain. And I was doing spinal taps for Richard May, who's trying to study serotonin and spinal fluid in depressed um, Parkinson's patients. And then Mary Sano was working that was, you know, started studying Alzheimer's. And, and that there was a whole group of people at, at um, Columbia that were doing that. But that paper about that there were stroke lesions, that if you looked at a systematic set of stroke patients about a month after the stroke. Some people got depressed and some people didn't. And this paper was very inspirational to a lot of psychiatrists. He did this study with a neurologist, Tom Price, at University of Maryland. And basically what everybody took away from this was that 66% of all the people who had a stroke, a post-stroke depression were in the frontal pole, left frontal pole. You actually read the paper carefully. A third of the patients were in the parietal cortex, and half of that third were not in the left hemisphere. So again, if you don't read the paper, you miss the message. It was always about the closer you are to the frontal pole in the left, or people do imaging. He had identified that you damage default mode. He actually had you damage default mode in the parietal cortex or in the frontal pole, totally missed because we didn't know about default mode now. But when you look at that in context, message was there. And I should probably have a picture that has the bipyridal lesions, but I'll have to remember to change it. Now, at the same time at Hopkins, so then going to do imaging with opiate receptors, studying epilepsy, um, Mayla DeLong started working with Sergio Starkstein, a neuropsychiatrist, neurologist from Argentina. And together that top row was studying systematically just characterizing depression in basal ganglia disorders. Sergio was force of nature, he ran around looking at all of these patients and just cataloging. I'm down in the basement with the scanner. Nobody had access unless you were in the scanner room. I mean, it was, nobody had access clinically, but that we developed a partnership. So we, I had the scanner and I could barter. They had some grants, but kind of didn't have any kind of scientific control of where the studies were going. And we developed a very simple hypothesis about how to use Malin, you know, Gary Alexander's model of basal ganglia circuits, of which was theoretical, that, that Alexander Strick and DeLong's famous segregated circuit papers, when we showed them our data on Parkinson's depression, they threw up their hands and said, we just made that kind of non-motor stuff up, we study motor physiology, we study the butamen, you know, M1. And it's like, it's theoretical. And then you had someone like Suzanne Haber, who was studying the anatomy and really took on how were frontal subcortical basal ganglia things really organized in monkeys. And again, you know, what you take away from this slide is collaboration, cross-group thinking, 
everybody's got a piece of the puzzle, but nobody's got everything. And everybody kind of has to work on it together. And through a series of experiments, we were, the simple question was, is there a common pattern in people who are depressed if they're a match for their neurological disorder? And that's where the story for me, it's, it's a go, no go decision. If you can't match people with Parkinson's by every feature except presence or absence of depression, there's not something on one of these PET scans, go home, because it's not there and Freud's right. But in fact, small numbers, you could see these patterns and there was the same pattern in neurological disease independent of the disease. If you were depressed, you had the same pattern. If you didn't have um, um, a neurological disease, you seemed to have the same pattern until it turned out you didn't. So again, in all of these stories, it's the exception, not the rule that moves things forward. But what started to emerge is that if you started to use treatment as a probe, or if you use behavior as a probe with these functional scans, they were crude. You know, the people do optogenetics with cell-specific mapping, you know, laugh at this stuff. This is what we had. You look at the level of resolution and you go, is it good enough? You know, look, when I trained, the attending was always right. And you learned they weren't always right, kind of like your parents, when you got a scanner and that kind of, you found that there were lots of ways to get a phenomena finding. And when you had the data, you could revise your hypothesis, which is what this is. And what we did is we threw people in the scanner that were ill, we treated them with Prozac they were in the hospital. We had people like a placebo. I was convinced, I was told I needed to do placebo. I didn't want to do placebo. I wanted to take away those things. But the placebo experiment was extremely important because people do get better on placebo. Then you have a map of how you get better on placebo if they get better. And what we found is when you got better, this frontal hypometabolism normalized. What we didn't expect is there were areas of the brain that we didn't know were abnormal that also changed on the drug. And there was a relationship between these, these areas kind of deep in the brain. This is the first time we saw this subcolossal cingulate area 25, Broadman's area 25, was that when you had depression recovery, you also turned down this area that didn't know was abnormal to start. You also turned down the anterior insula. And if you started to look at just correlations of these blobs, the magnitude of the frontal correction correlated with the magnitude of these paralimbic decreases. They were yoked. And if you tried to do correlation, we had cognitive tests. We didn't have a good mood test, except the mood score, which was like one item. The frontal went with how you did on kind of slow thinking, you know, Wisconsin card sword. And so we went hunting for the mood part with the idea, this is easy. Well, well, some people were doing mood induction. We'll throw them in the scanner. We'll have them think negative thoughts wait through until they're crying. We'll take a scan. And, you know, we did this expecting to isolate the limbic part and isolate the limbic part. So in some ways, it was a failed experiment. In some ways, the best experiment we ever did. I couldn't get this study published. It's only exceeded by the DBS experiment, which is totally based on this. Why? Because people couldn't get their head wrapped around the depression treatment with the mood induction being superimposed and being flipped patterns. People want it as two papers. It's not two papers, it's the same finding. This circuit is activated in normal people over five minutes. It's modulated in sick people over six weeks, same circuit, Lots of other things may be going on, forced what was overlapping. And again, you suddenly have a set of regions that are reciprocally communicating rapidly. And limbic and cortex are in this yoked and reciprocal relationship. And if we started to look at any other treatment, if you got better area 25 down regulated, that was the common thing. What happened in frontal cortex? could be all over the place. It wasn't necessarily just DLPFC or DMPFC. That got very messy. But area 25 was consistent. And if it didn't downregulate, it didn't get well. And so as we looked at the literature, looked at, we were doing kind of 
not heroic things. I didn't do TMS, still don't do TMS, you know, but TMS is find the place in prefrontal cortex that talks to area 25. That's how you localize with imaging. So that experiment became very useful for lots of other things, even if there's not attribution, or even if people didn't realize what that meant, because they're not structurally connected to each other. So it's a functional thing. So why do I give this introduction? Because you can study all these different kinds of depression, but what do you do with people that stop responding? And that's actually where you really get your most insight about what is depression, because there's a walking wounded. There's secondary depression. You're depressed because you get terminal diagnosis, you get diagnosed with Alzheimer's. What do we do all the time in neurology clinics? You know, sometimes the depression will precede the Parkinson's, the Alzheimer's. You know, if you have a late, someone presents with first depression at age 55 and their spouse didn't just die, you're looking for the degenerative disease until proven otherwise. And we know that, Kaiser doesn't know that. They talk about, you know, two peaks in terms of, you know, but you have the psychiatrists that work with movement disorder, they know that. And, and that's why these teams are really interesting. But there's a phenomena, it's like multiple sclerosis. So what do we know of multiple sclerosis? People get optic neuritis, get one hit, you kind of tell them, don't worry, you know, you're probably, probably never gonna have another problem. Then you have relapsing remitting, these people, Get these hits and then it goes away and you look at their scan they got all these white matter lesions and you go how can you don't have more going on and then you have these people that have suddenly switched to they were relapsing remitting and then they get progressive in every hit you never go back to ground zero what is that it's what happens in depression in terms of phenomenology the more episodes you have the likelihood that whatever treatment you have, that you will stay well a year, gets diminishingly small. So what is that? So I just want to introduce the idea. It's more concept than reality, but what is it to come out of an episode and go back? What are the worst thing about chronic illness or unpredictable illness? They have the symptoms, whatever it is, you know, I don't think it sounds very good to get multiple sclerosis at one time. You can't walk, the next time you're blind, and that sounds pretty bad and it's unpredictable. Depression is you can't wrap your head around your life because you suddenly can't do anything. And if you can't know what you're going to do, you can't plan, and you get into this vicious cycle. You get into an attack, and what happens when you get stuck and you can't get out? And everybody in the field, me included, Earlier on, getting people to the treatment that's best for them is a thing. The state of this network can be in polar opposite. It's not a totally different state of the brain. It's a different configuration. It's like in stroke. So how come you can include a vessel and somebody doesn't have any circulation? How come they're normal? Because they have a whole set of backup maneuvers to compensate. Not infinite, but there are backup plans. I think it's the same with depression, that you, you have pathways, they're either damaged, they can't compensate, you know, it's a whole other thing to talk about, but you finally get to where you're just stuck because there's no way left to compensate. So we basically said, very, very simple-minded, this was opportunity, wasn't hard, had a surgeon said, if you can't talk, drug, shock, area 25 and get it to downregulate. Maybe just go in like Parkinson's and stimulate because high frequency seems to block the STN kind of, wasn't like I really wanted a lesion. I just wanted to turn down that activity and little knowledge sometimes is better than a lot of knowledge. Because if I really know how DBS worked, I probably wouldn't have done it because it wouldn't have made any sense. Too complicated, I'm not sure what should happen but wanted to downregulate a dairy 25. Lozano in Toronto had already done many, many Parkinson's surgeries by this idea in 2001. And he goes, oh yeah, I can, I can get there safely. I learned in the New York Times, you know, after we had done these five people and published, he never thought it would work. 
but he was curious and he knew he could get there. He never told me that. That was great. Well, he didn't think I was crazy. He knew he could do it and he, he could test it and do five people and see, is it safe? And see what happens. So we basically took the PET scan blob. There was no tractography. We knew that at area 25, it projected to the hypothalamus accumbens and to the brainstem, periaqueductal gray down to the dorsal raphae also. So it's like, okay, that makes sense. And there was a literature in animals on projections of why this area, which also is the highest area of serotonin transporter, might be a target for an SSRI. We knew it connected to the frontal lobe in some way. We could see the projections. So we'll try to downregulate it locally and we'll, we'll do something, dot, 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 to everything it's connected to. And if we're lucky, we'll downregulate, we'll get a disinhibition of this reciprocal hold of limbic on cortex. So plan the surgery. We made an estimate from the PET scan. We looked at an atlas. We looked at the MRI. We put in two electrodes. We turned it on and watched what happened. First patient had an interesting phenomena in the OR, but other patients didn't necessarily have that. Lozano goes, oh, just, you don't need to hunt around the OR. We've got it in the right spot. You know, it'll be like Parkinson's. You'll just try it, turn it on. We could not reproduce the acute effect in everybody once we left the OR. We fight about, you need to keep testing it. He goes, no, you don't. You serve at the discretion of a surgeon in their OR. So figure out how to get them to do what you want. But that when we gave small amounts of stim every day in the hospital, waiting to do some scans at the end of the week, we actually saw that people had decreased um, their scores, even with an hour of stim every day. I'd come in and they didn't have the battery yet. I'd kind of turn it on. And, and that was remarkable because these were ECT failures, people on nine meds, people at the end of the line. It took us a year to get the first patient. Doctors would not refer because it was new, psychosurgery history, even though this doesn't work, turn it off, take it out, you're done. Okay, only the risk of being in surgery and it's modest risk, particularly with experienced surgeon, but no one wanted to refer, no one ever wants to refer to anything new. But week off, you got a little bit of regression, never did, these people did not go back to baseline. Important clue, something happened with that little bit of stim, they weren't well, they were different and didn't go back to where they started. Even though the patients didn't feel good, when you looked at the numbers, again, patients don't know what they're experiencing. They're lagging behind their brain. And turn it on, leave it on, 130 hertz, just like Parkinson's, don't make any changes. At the end of six months, four were better, really better, and two, we shouldn't have bothered. And they separated about two months. PET scans prove the point. PET scans were done that when it didn't work, I'd know why. Go back to doing just regular stuff. And this is the fork in the road for me where I actually hadn't planned what would happen because what did happen is we went from five to 20. We were following people over time, waiting for them to relapse. They didn't. That you could go out six years and people who got better stayed better with ongoing STEM without much change. Um, we repeated it at Emory with Paul Holzheimer. We didn't do as well at the beginning, which was another clue. And then as we made adjustments to where exactly we were stimulating, we could increase the number of people who were well. And we have people that we follow now. I get emails from patients in Toronto. A lot of people are not well or died or got explanted. It's 20 years later. But you know, I have a couple of patients once a year write me and go on the anniversary of when they felt better or when they had surgery, that they're still there. So it's a pacemaker change something fundamental. Now, you know, people got very excited when we published in 2005. Actually, a lot of people in neurology kind of woke up that actually I was a neurologist, not a psychiatrist. I mean, people are very confused. My radiologist, because they do PET scanning, my Psychiatrist, I study depression, you know, none of the above, neurologist. But, you know, people 
saw it, we did not have all the details, okay? People thought I had magic powers that people got better for me because I'm so persuasive. And it's like, I'd have a very different job if I had that kind of persuasion over people that wasn't about a cattle prod in your brain giving stimulation. But you know, people have all kinds of magical thoughts and people had other logic. I had, we had our logic. People were going in to the incumbents to push motivation, positive mood. People went into the media forebrain bundle. People designed randomized controlled trials, including St. Jude Medical, that, that's the Broaden study, famous study that was halted. At six months, active did not beat champ. And in none of the studies did active beat champ for different reasons. In the medial forebrain bundle, people got better fast. They didn't wait long enough to see a separation because a little bit of stim or just the implant like Parkinson's. So they got greedy that they wanted to show they were really fast. And then, and, and all these targets, if you get better, you have long-term response, but managing them is different. And this is where the world went off the rails because people didn't realize that underpowered studies that were halted doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means you weren't ready. And you have these long-term follow-ups on people doing well long-term you just missed your endpoint for an FDA trial. Dot, 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 people interpret that as it didn't work. And I suddenly couldn't get a grant, couldn't get a paper published, even though we were just doing our research, refining, optimizing. And this is where my father always said, life is not fair. So how do you, you either figure out how to reconcile the contradiction or you do something else? And everybody pointed at whose fault it was. The surgeon says it's a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, no, the surgeons didn't do it right. And then I hate the Hamilton. It's not a good readout. It's fine. Um, and then we didn't have a readout of what's really happening. But we did because one of our patients at Emory, because we knew we were in a circuit. We just didn't have a way to measure it. And as soon as we got to Emory, we collected diffusion data on every patient, even though we don't know what to do with it. And I went through four graduate students, postdocs, having someone try to figure out how to look at it. And we had this one patient that should have gotten better. No comorbidity, no anything. And this is her pattern of her Hamilton over the six months. She clearly had this initial decrease and she just got kind of stuck and she didn't make the response line. And when you talk to her, she go, well, you know, you're better. And she goes, I'm really not, I'm really pushing. I'm still pushing through this resistance, it's there. So we said, what do we do? We go back to the scans and we look at where the electrode is. At this point, we had started looking at tractography. We're kind of trying to figure out kind of a, a shorthand was how to get into this white matter fiber that seemed to be going to the frontal lobe. You know, we could see it and we planned the anatomy surgery. We just always kind of straddled that. And when you looked at her scan, we were too shallow. And we go, well, maybe the right side's okay. The right side was okay. The left side was bad. We had already been learning that the left side seemed to be more important than the right. And we didn't have any wiggle room here. So I went to the surgeon, Bob Gross. I said, okay, can you like push it in more? He goes, Pushing it in means going back to the operating room, taking it out, doing it again. And it's like, okay, can you do that? And he goes, why don't you just turn it up and get more current? I said, try that, it's not working. I said, but it's too shallow. Like we're missing something. So he thought, it's crazy. They did it. So we went to the OR, took it out, put it in, made a prediction by now saying, let's go deeper, getting into this track we can see. And on the table, as we stimulated there, she just expressed this wall dissipated. You know, kind of sat there. I mean, we kind of seen the phenomenon, but not predicting it like that. And Cameron McIntyre, who's here now, he was a case at the time. He was doing tissue models of stimulating gray matter versus white matter, all theoretical. Went to him and said, well, I've read your papers. Can you model this? What did we do different? 
and Tian, his graduate student, and Ki Sung Choi was my graduate student, that Cameron basically looked at what we were doing from the data in the two places with the real data, we were getting into different tracks. And that became the anchor for everything because then we could look at all the data, the people got better, the people who didn't, and say, if you get better, we own it. You know, the psychiatrists go, oh, no, it's the therapy. Oh, I tweak their medicine a little bit. No, if you have an electrode and you're better, what are we doing the same in everybody? We basically subjected the scans to an analysis of every voxel. So figure out with, with um, Cameron's volume of tissue activated models, what it, tracks are you stimulating? Binderize them, stack them up in standard space. Every voxel gets to stay in the map if, of a responder. And if you have variation that's so different in everyone, you'll have a blank map. There's however many responders you put into the map, every voxel has to be in all of them. And we got a map and we got a map that was four bundles, people that got better when we hunted around trial and error, we threw them into the map in two years, map didn't degrade. So we had created a common map, not an average map. And then we could use that common map to actually plan a surgery in an individual and drive around until you visually hit single and bundle, forceps minor, on fasciculus, and these small fibers that go subcortically that you can't even see past the thalamus, but you can tell where you are on the, on the z-axis. You get too high, you don't get those. And in the, in the other patient, once we got into that, here's how, how she changed and progressed. So there was something about being in the right circuit we tested it prospectively with, if I go there and I don't change where we're stimulating, you'll get to change it for six months. Do you do better? Easier, but less work. And you can see what happened. The red line was the first group with just anatomy. The green was the second line where we tested it prospectively, very fast first effect. And then a slower effect, but pretty good over time. And the third group is where we actually give a lot of stim in the OR. So we could take electrophysiology and actually something we had learned in Toronto, put it in, turn it on, send them home because we didn't have the resources and didn't have a big team. We got back to that 10 years later and then could map it. And here's what you learn, which I told St. Jude, beg them to get the tractography wouldn't spend the extra money to do a diffusion scan for an extra 10 minutes because what are they gonna do with it? We had the location of how people were doing in the long-term follow-up, with long-term follow-up. We had badly, and we put them into the human connectome and modeled, even though it's not, people who never got better was because they missed the left singular. So everybody talking about it, it doesn't work the neurology will set you free and you just wait for them. So 10 years later, or however many years, 2017 is when they publish. They're now coming back. They have breakthrough designation owned by Abbott. They're gonna try again. And it'll be informed by tractography or it won't be done. So again, it takes incredibly long time. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, do you know what room this is then? Uh, yeah. Now, what can you do? once you know more about where. Now you can study kind of what happens, maybe you can kind of figure out how it, it works. And what um, Allison Water did in a collaboration again, actually with the Duke team, with um, Cameron, we can ping the brain, look to see what happens in the rest of the cortex. And what happens in the rest of the cortex when you're in this confluence is the same in everybody. So you have a cortical, of a potential marker. It's sensitive to dose. If you're a little off, you look at one of the other contacts, you can degrade the cortical evoke potential. We've not developed it as a verification, but we could. I mean, that would take more work and people are studying what's the contribution of the cingulate versus the forceps. That's what um, the McIntyre team is doing, but you can see how you might be able to use that clinically. But then the real clinical question became an observation 
on the long term made by the psychiatrist. When do they turn it up? Because the only variable is you don't change the the parameters. You never could figure out there wasn't a fast enough signal change to explore the entire parameter space. 130 hertz have never changed it. 20 years works. If on the new devices you have to do 125 or 140, it doesn't matter. Flip a coin, do something. Change the pulse width from 60 to 90. I could never remember which one we were doing, and they both work. So there's high frequency is the big thing. The dose, when to turn it up, that seems to be the only variable. And what's this thing? You take the average of these people doing really well, you get to about two, three months, and you get a wobble. And Andrew Crowell, who's both trained in electrophysiology and psychoanalysis, said, it's like they go back to being teenagers. Like suddenly you got to retrain them. They, she kind of goes, they're just obstinate. She called it the rough patch. Everybody has one. Stay the course. When do you turn it up? When do you not? And look what happened in the individual variability. Yellow line is when Andrew or Patricio decided to turn it up. Well, how come they turned it up here and they waited on this one? Well, they're talking to the patient. They're somehow convinced it's a life stressor. It's a, no, I need to turn Magical thinking. They have no idea. They're not a marker. So we kind of said, okay, now we can look at physiology. Maybe we can figure out what happened. So we went back to this phenomenology that people were describing in the ORs first step and said, what happens when you hit the switch, you can see a change. I could always know when they were gonna say something. They didn't get a big smiley face or anything. It's like an opening of the eyes or relaxation around the eyes, they're in this head frame. You just could know and you play a game, you're watching someone, you're testing the contacts and then all of a sudden you see something, then you wait and they say something. And they would say all kinds of wild stuff. I feel lighter, the void, I'm out of a hole. I want to walk my dog. I want to clean the, I mean, crazy stuff, amusing stuff out of the attractor immediately. Pain is gone. I can move. What do you want to do when you can move? Everything I can't do that's so hard all the time. So we try to look at are there physiological signals? And yeah, you can get an autonomic response, a skin conductance response. It's bigger on the left than the right. You look at which contact gives you that. It's when you hit the cingulate. Then you have someone like Peter Strick who models in monkeys, what are the parts of the brain that project to the adrenal gland, to the stress system, to the body? Cingulate. And spots in the cingulate, first clues about this. But the real thing we wanted was we put both electrodes in, we hooked them up to be able to get the local field potential. And Mo, who was a computer science student, wanted to do some fancy machine learning analysis on what happened at baseline. And after we gave 10 minutes of STEM in the OR, and he built a model and he could make a very clear classification between the beginning and the end of surgery. It had importance features that were dominated by beta, beta decrease, kind of like movement, kind of like what you see in Parkinson's, but also alpha right side. And Allison Waters, who had done all those evoke potentials, just looked at the LFP and you can see, you don't need machine learning to see that everybody had this beta decrease and that everybody a week after surgery had this carryover and the carryover correlated with the magnitude of this beta, but it didn't correlate with how they were doing six months later. So everyone goes, well, who cares? That became another clue, very hard paper to get published, even though we had you know, nine out of nine with the same signal. You know, I think that wouldn't be hard to get published, but it was because people wanted a different biomarker. So we got access to the Medtronic device where you could have LFP all the time off the device. And with some very clever engineers at Georgia Tech, Shankar Alagapin and his, it was the postdoc and Chris Rizal, who's a signal processing engineer. We basically took the data. We already knew people were better. Didn't try to do close loop. We said, they get better. We do the same thing, stay the course. We measure everything over six months, and then we model what happened. We tried to model it by the Hamilton score. There's the 
five people, they all got better. Six, the last month, they were all well. First month, they were different, not well. And we said, let's, why can't we do it with the Hamilton in between? Because what was happening at the beginning wasn't happening at the end. There was wobble in the middle. We assumed Hamilton's score had something to do with what happened. Almost not exactly. So they, best, they built a simple classifier. What's, can we tell the difference between the end and the beginning? Stable well, not well. And the answer was, yeah, close to 90% classification, five people. And then we said, that classifier signal every week, sick or well. And when do you switch from the early stem to the late stem? And what happened is, here's an example. When is the stable biomarker predicting stable Hamilton response? Two weeks in a row, no wobble, not even one point. If you go below 50% response, you're, you're not stable. And it did 94%. Accuracy in this, you know, you know, leave one out cross validation. You know, look, we don't have split sample. We've replicated this. The important features were beta and gamma. All the bands are involved, and the important part back to the imaging. People got stable at different times, and the question was: Is what could we know at baseline that would predict why you weren't stable? Why would we do it that way? Because I couldn't put people back in a scanner to do it the regular way. So we had to make a prediction, but we're already doing predictions about baseline, about how people did for drug and therapy. So we just took the baseline data we had, we had fMRI and we had white matter, we had the integrity of the white matter. And what we found is there were hits in the white matter that we were stimulating and the magnitude of the functional anisotropy damage was predicting, not if you got well, but how long it took. The more damaged you were, the longer it took. And we could also see it with functional MRI. And the bundle that was most important was a singular bundle, then multiple hits, but the interruption of the singular bundle between the SEC and the MCC, this MCC region, the functional connectivity could be normal, could be low, also went with how long it took. So it was almost like the backbone in the PAPE circuit determined the repair function of what you had. So this was, it took two and a half years to get this paper. And I'd be lying to say I'm not happy to have a nature paper in my career. It wasn't worth two and a half years. I think it was worth it to Shankar. It was not worth two and a half years to have this finding, languishing, trying to get it published. But in the meantime, we changed devices and we've replicated it the imaging and the finding so that I think it's a keeper. And what we also did was go back, you know, with a very clever machine learning computer scientist to take something we'd also been doing, but to do it right. To look at the action units. We know that this anterior segment of singular cortex is the emotional face area and actually model the face the same way. Last month, videos, first month, and can classify it as well as the brain. And you can start to connect the dots that as you repair the white matter, your face is changing. Face is the observation of the circuit repair in my mind. And that now we can ask the question of when someone's distressed, stay the course and you're just having a wobble, get a therapist, exercise, or need to turn it up. And that's the current work. And here's a proof of principle. So here are the six people that we had data on for the experiment. Look at this outlier. She got better really fast. She got better really fast on ECT, ketamine, but never lasted. She got better super fast. I just figured she was going to relapse too. She was on a really low dose. And she did great until she wasn't at about 16 weeks. We got a call. She ended up in the hospital. Moved her back down to Georgia, turned her up because she'd been at a sub, she had a lower dose than everybody else. We looked at what her biomarker did based on what we'd modeled in the people who had the routine course. Her biomarker and her Hamilton were great. And here's why all of this matters. A good month before she was complaining 
where the psychiatrist seeing her once a week recognized that there was something wrong. Her brain had already become unstable. And we could have anticipated this a month before it happened. And we turned her up and she regained things. And we've had other examples. And what we've now done is try to kind of look at well, what happens in the network. Again, we do PET scans have been my workhorse, even though everyone goes, oh God, that's so yesterday. It works, it's predictable, it's metabolism. You can do blood flow, you can put people in the scanner. And what Ki Sung and Jung Ho found was, let's use the resting state networks that everybody cares about with fMRI. Is only just have 17 regions of interest in an undersampled study. What changes in the brain over time? Bring them back four times. Two networks change, salience, so insula, cingulate, and default mode, back to Robinson. And that's main effect of time independent of how you do. And then if you look within those two networks and go, how do they correlate at any point in time with what your score is? Salience doesn't go, it, it, it gets modulated and it stays the same in everybody. Default mode is a signal of how you're doing and what it does early, what the anterior part does to the frontal lobe happens early. What happens with the whole default mode, getting into the posterior singular, getting integration of the entire thing happens late. And so suddenly we're back to Robinson with fancier data. And here's where, when you really have a hypothesis, we went to our colleagues at um, Sinai, Peter Rudebeck, who works in non-human primates, is interested in decision-making. He had a postdoc, Satoka Fujimoto, who is a neurosurgeon, who was interested. And with Ki Sung's method for targeting in humans, we applied it to these smaller brains and macaques. We did stimulation for two months in normal macaques to start to actually see what we did to the white matter because we couldn't put people back in the scanner that we had done because it wasn't safe because of the device, which was prototype, which we can now do. But what we learned in Satoka's experiment was that there were changes in the white matter with just two months of stimulation. It was very focal where it was significant. And when you looked at this mid-singulate region post-mortem with EM at the white matter, actually have mature oligos. And you see them on ipsilateral. It's hard to see the picture, but the stimulation site has these markers of mature all of those. Here's the graph. We're looking in under bundles. It doesn't seem the cingulate is important, different from the under bundles, which are less well behaved. And we now, for the first time, this is hot off the press from our graduate student, Han Ol Song, in Ki Sung's lab. We can put people back in the scanner with the commercial device, because we have five people that we've done that behave the same way. And we can look to see what happened to the white matter. And just to, I got this data four days ago, he broke up the cingulum bundle to see what was happening. The whole cingulum bundle is increasing its functional anisotropy. You can see that in this mid here near the face area and here near the autonomic area, the white matter is growing vocally. The left is different from the right. So we now have evidence indirect, but that we can track that actually you're repairing the damaged white matter, which may explain why stim induced plasticity. There's work from Michelle Manchi, pediatric neurologist at Stanford on glioblastoma and the nature of track B, BDNF is Jim McNamara studies this also. These mechanisms are common for plasticity. They're affected by inflammation. These are important mechanisms for multiple sclerosis, but STEM seems to do this in an interesting way. So we are now for just an extra minute. Now we're playing because again, how can we do this in the real world? Again, we do fun stuff in the lab, but how can you use things that we can do in everyday life? Wear a watch, do a video diary, you know, talk to yourself about what you're thinking and use natural language processing, not what question does someone ask you in the clinic. And we can start, and this is just to show you, but we have daily, twice a day, people record diaries. We have weekly Hamiltons. 
We have a daily online way. When patients see value, they will do it, like brushing your teeth. You will collect the data and then you can model it. And the bottom is Steve trying to start to apply natural language models to the videos and the tone of the video. And you don't even need to know what it is. You can see that the tone of what people say with emotional, you know, big data models on language now, every week there's a new one. That, um, so I have chatbot to write your papers, you know. Um, but you can take what you have and run it through the models and start to get patterns, just like we did with the LFP. And that you can start to pick up patterns in what they're saying at home before it shows up on the readout that will actually equally predict that they're getting into trouble. So even if you don't have the readout on the brain, I want an alarm on the brain, call us up. I don't need a close loop, I need an alarm to check on them. But that their own speech may be able to give us the same signal. And that's where we're going because Abbott doesn't have a, I mean, again, again, life isn't fair. We've got a readout with the company that isn't doing the trial. And the company that's gonna do the trial has no plans to have a readout. So if you get through the trial, then maybe the other company will jump in, just like all these companies do. They wait for somebody else to de-risk it, and then everybody jumps on board. So we've also built, you know, the inspiration is the rodent people have these boxes, they look at behavior, they model with machine learning, different components of movement. I had someone say, when we had the idea, they said, you need to watch, you know, this movie, Dr. Strange. And we basically built this room that is not AR or VR. You move in a mixed reality environment. You can see what the computer sees on just the wrist moving when you ask people to move. And you can see examples of where does your wrist sit? Parkinson's patients, asymmetric. You can see they don't move a lot. It's asymmetric. Healthy people use the whole space. The depressed patients tend to move very little and more, they move with a lot of variance. So with this machine learning, you can start to even look at movement in ways that you're not quite sure what you're looking at. I mean, they're not like Parkinson's, but they're irregular how they move until it's actually smoother. And here, what our, our student, she's now a first year medical student at, at Sinai, she noticed that at the tipping point when the brain deteriorated, the variation in how the patients drew the circle that we could get with the machine learning also changed. So suddenly we're back to mood through video and facial expression through the neurology. Movement to the mood movement is all you need. Talk to the therapist. What, do I, what did the therapist do to start behavioral activation? Go for a walk. Your mother and what she did to you and your child, you get to it later. Rebuild your brain. And that's kind of where we are. This was a patient who told us, who had, who had drawn her entire experience. We were all caricatures. Everything she went through from vomiting, from the pain meds after surgery to listening to us say everything. She had documented it as a, she's a professional artist because she couldn't express what it was. And she really gets to where, how do you see your future that, has unpredictability and is bumpy that you're going in the forward direction. And that's where we kind of are now is we have these mechanisms, have our circuit, stay the course, and now we figure out how we rehab people effectively. So again, I've made sort of disparaging comments about psychiatrists. I love psychiatrists. You must have them for this because the person who now has a fixed brain, this backbone is working, is the person they always were. People have personality issues. They have anxiety that we don't trick. They ruminate. They may need an SSRI. But all I want to do is know what's the backbone? How is it working? And the rest is their job, as it always there. We have these collaborations. We refer, but actually the first part is the brain. And I'll stop there.
So I think that, you know, with Renee's work on the posterior hippocampus and the role of serotonin in the hippocampus combined with all the models of early stress, social defeat, um, you know, Bruce um, Wessler here on, you know, using learned helplessness, which is my favorite model because it is on the original studies of Steve Mayer of infralimbics projection and need for serotonin that I think this role of serotonin and control and variation and the fact that you can't move is really essential. And I think when you really look at the anatomy of Renee, I mean, again, it's rodent, not human, but dorsal hippocampus is retrosplenial projections from the posterior cingulate into the hippocampus. That if you have interruption of the pape circuit, fundamentally, you have everything you need. You know, these arguments of how do you model depression in a rodent? You don't need a big frontal cortex and you can stay to the frontal cortex you can, you can model these fundamental PAPES circuit components and that the interaction of how 25 infralimbic talks to midline thalamus goes to CA1 hippocampus with modulation of the chemistries there. If you add the stress with um, decreasing dendrites and all the stuff that Bruce McEwen did, also with Renee Hen is, is um, I think, an organizing principle. We've started to do computational voltammetry developed by Reed Montague with computational um, neuroscientist Jousey Gu. So in the OR, when we're stimulating on the left, we do voltammetry on the right. And we can take different tasks and parse the reward decision-making piece, which is dopamine, from the reaction time, social interaction that seems to be serotonin. So I think that, again, it's this big puzzle with no one piece that's all explanatory and an eye on, you know, what is plasticity with ketamine, with psychedelics that are short term. And as, as Bill was telling me yesterday, Bruce, Bill was telling me yesterday, what's the timeline when you manipulate the S2 receptor? And and I think we just put these mechanistic pieces together with these different pathways and everybody's got a piece of this, but it, I think this is subcortical. And I think it's, we've got the anatomical breaks and we're working, we're looking at compensation. We're coming in at different places. So I think it, it's a continuum that's kind of the same. So uh, I just like to say, people have to leave. That's fine. We'll still take a few more minutes for questions. Yeah, sorry about oh, that. No, no, no. I Felix. Uh, no, people who leave, leave, leave. Yes, yes I appreciate your staying because I know that you have to get back to the clinic and and everything. But I appreciate your staying. It's nice of you to say that you might actually be useful. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. Go be useful. Go be useful. Um, um, Felix, take it away. Uh, yes, uh, that was a, a beautiful presentation. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, one of them is, is bilateral stimulation necessary for clinical response? Oh. Um, and then I have two more questions I was going to ask after that. One is, um, is there a role for focused ultrasound in modulating uh, CG25 in a non-invasive fashion? Yes. And in patients who have infarcts involving CG25, are there alternative tracks to stimulate if you consider DBS? Set up a small stance to do left and then right to put in bilateral leads and do it. He didn't know about this variation of time. We did tractography. They weren't quite as precise as we were, a different surgeon, but that he couldn't see a difference between right and left. We've not it really looks as though the two sides contribute and that one side alone probably isn't enough. And so it's interesting that the left is dominant, but it doesn't seem to, that the right doesn't seem to be redundant. It may be that you don't need as much forceps minor, but our original analysis said you do. But I think that that's still a work in progress that you could do with the voc response. What do you get rid of if you if you remove bundles to even the evoke response. And that's what Cameron's group is doing. They, the cingulate and the forceps have some 
parts of the evoke response that are the same, but they definitely do things that are independent. So that's number one. The focus ultrasound and and kind of met the focus ultrasound team um, last night, Dr. Hayward, that um, we've been collaborating with some people in Utah who have been doing Area 25 focus ultrasound. We're trying to get a grant. If you give acute stim in the confluence, you get, like we get that acute effect. And it has some, some um, decay function. So it's not like you turn it on and you turn it off. And there's a lot of work on this low frequency focus ultrasound that looks as though even in addiction that you may get some carryover. I think the time will tell how long it lasts, whether or not if you keep doing it, you can build up this, does it have a repair function or not? Or does it just like ECT, move it and then have a decay function? Will it matter how damaged your white matter? You know, is there an activation energy? You really have the attractor. What does it take to pop out of the attractor and not fall back in? I'm very taken by you may need to repair, that the reason there's durability is you actually have repair. And so I think the bar will be raised with focus ultrasound. You know, accelerated TMS works, and then you relapse. So they went from saying, oh, it's great. You don't need DBS. We can do this in a week to, oh, people relapse, and the faster they get better, the faster they relapse. So now their talking points are on maintenance accelerated TMS. We're back to, if you're needing to come back, then cost, time, the, the price of relapse, which does a lot to your self-confidence, you know, which has a, an, an impact on the person that you can't model. If you can trust being well, you do everything different than if you're waiting to relapse. It's like kind of, if, if you're an entrepreneur, what's the price of failure? If homelessness is price of failure, you probably won't lean in. So I think the focus ultrasound thing, I would love to see how we use it to see if you're going to be a responsive patient so that actually use it as a biomarker to know you're in the right place or that you have right phenotype, and I kind of make a projection. If I had the machine, which you guys just got, I'm very jealous, that um, that's how I'd use it. But I think this whole field's going to change. Open right, up no, the blood-brain barrier. Reverse. Hmm? You can do reverse it with step one, not the blasting. Yeah, no, not the blasting to make the lesion like ET. So you guys just got very few places in the country have it. You can buy them as standalone units, but they have less precision. This is in the MR scanner. You can have the same precision, do low frequency focus ultrasound. You can open up the blood brain barrier and enhance drug delivery, whole other thing. But you can give low frequency stim, which these people have done, and you get, again, that acute change. So I think, you know, again. That's your priority. Yeah, your exactly, priority. exactly, exactly. It how, may how be that, that going. That question. Like, that's your piece of scale, so you're really trying to save it. So something like that. Yeah. So. Yes. So I think that getting people to enroll people that, I mean, they, I think they probably won't require failing ECT because a lot of people don't want ECT. But the same, you know, don't have comorbidities so you don't enhance the probability of dealing with things the DBS doesn't treat. I mean, just like Parkinson's, you don't treat freezing, you don't treat dementia. But that getting and scaling how to do the tractography, my current surgeon, Brian Capel and Ki Sung Choi, instead of the party we have to do the planning, how to make it really simple. So they've been working on some ways where you can use the bundle precision and kind of help surgeons to do it. And we'll watch how to get that implemented um, for the surgeon. Are we going to help do every case? That's not scalable, but that may get you to a trial. And you know, the Alzheimer's trial, um, which I don't know where it is, where they're doing fornix stim, every case was reviewed. And it wasn't allowed to go forward if you weren't implanted properly. So I think oversight can help as you teach. But I, I'll make a snarky comment. I remember 
when we were training people how to do it, how we did it. They didn't want to hear from a neurologist. Surgeons didn't want to hear from me, our instincts of how we did it. And everybody wanted to be an artist. And everyone had an idea of what they would do even though they'd never done it. If you're in a trial, you do what you're told. You want to do an experiment, get a grant, take the risk. And it was very interesting to see. It's easy for me to say that. They're surgeons. You know, they may think they're being safer, or they have a better way to do it, they're creative. Not when you don't know what the target is. So I think everybody has learned, but I think the scaling is where I lose sleep. And I, you know, this is gonna be a randomized control trial. You know, the details are not yet known. And we'll see, and in the meantime, we'll figure out how to do it in a way that would be scalable so that people could do it. But I'm, I'm worried. You know, how could I not be? All right, uh, thanks everyone for coming and thanks Dr. Rayburn. Thanks. Dr. Posner, is she gonna come back? Don't, uh, yeah, we have to see what happens. Uh,